Mr. Blue by Miles Connolly, Chapter 5, Part 2. Blue must have had many friends. No man as generous of himself as he could have been long without them. Yet he seems to have had few intimates. Friendship was one of life's fine things to him, and yet he did not look upon it altogether as the rest of us do. Sometimes I think he was a friend out of charity. Once, I gather from this conversation, he had been mistaken in a friend. But he looked back on the treachery of the man he loved more with kindness than with pity, and more with pity than with grief. Friendship, at worst, he once said to me, is an investment. Your friend, no matter how he may turn out in the end, is an addition to your life. He brings some things, and whatever his disloyalty, these things he cannot take away. Once I met Blue riding around with an unimportant little snob who had inherited some money. He was an immediate and constant irritation to me. He seemed to think he deserved some credit for having the money he did not earn. He was offensively good-mannered, a trait common in men who have a passion for dancing attention on women and who usually cannot boast a genuine man-friend in the world. He was using Blue, I surmised, as an exhibit. I mentioned this to Blue. He laughed. What a Christian you are, he exclaimed. I think he was a friend to the fellow out of kindness. I suppose you consider the exhortation, love your neighbor a figure of speech. You would love only the lovable. Did you ever try to love someone who was mean, petty, shallow, selfish? Try it. I told him I was willing to love a villain, but that I could not arouse any affection for a mere annoyance, an irredeemable, uh, an irremediable nobody. I think I could love a lion, I said, but I doubt very much if I could love a mosquito. He regarded me seriously. You consider yourself too much, he returned. You could love a great enemy. Any healthy man could. Men have boasted that they were to be slain by Caesar, but one needs more than Vanny to love a, a, what you call, a mosquito. He meant, I suppose, that I needed special graces and charity and fortitude. But the topic to me, being a, as a poor Christian as Blue intimated, was distasteful. I let it drop. Blue was, I happened to learn, particularly fond of two Jewish lads. He was forever extolling their virtues. No one, he said to me once, is more generous and more loyal than a loyal and generous Jew. It is to these men that I am indebted for three of the blue letters. One, Mr. John Stone of Roxbury, Massachusetts, sent me this interesting passage from one of Blue's letters to him on the motion picture. Mr. Stone had, I gather, contemplated investing some money in the film industry. He mentioned this to Blue. The following long paragraph is the result. That Blue's remarks have no concern with the motion picture as an investment is typical of his impractical method of viewing things. Blue could see anything, even the motion picture, in terms of eternity. Quote, No printed word shall ring the new masses as did the printed words in the past. They have not time for the printed word. The day when a pamphlet distributed at a street corner could start a revolution or a new religion is over. The printed word is too common to be any longer compelling and too slow to be any longer dynamic. If you want to reach the masses, you can reach them through pictures. These new children can be bent and molded as they sit in the dark and wrapped before the magic of the mobile screen. There in the dark they can be lifted out of their daily servitude. There they can be raised high above their stone and steel environment. There they can be brought to the high places and shown the deeps beyond the hard horizon. There they can be taught to be superior to the great magnificent monsters that are their creations. There they can be taught to love this terrible new civilization because there they can be taught to look upon it as their child and not as their master. Here, then, is a mission for any agency. Here is a destiny for an art second to none in history, for it is given to the motion picture to save the soul of a civilization. End quote. There was one thing Blue could not view with Christian forbearance. That was bigotry. Any manifestation of bigotry against any color or creed would send the blood to his face. Mr. Caswell Ween, the second of his Jewish friends from Roxbury, Massachusetts, very kindly forwarded me this letter from Blue on bigotry. I quote one paragraph, which is enough to indicate the intensity of his feeling on the subject. Quote, 
There are natural excellencies which exist without a special support from heaven, amiability, for example, and generosity. And it seems that there are natural vices which beset man without any especial spiritual depravity or intervention of the devil, timidity, say, or querulousness. But as there are the supernatural virtues, so there are what one may call the supernatural vices. At least, there are vices which cannot be traced to indigestion or anemia, or to misinformation or to ignorance. Meanness is one such vice, boredom another. But at the head of the list is one of the most vicious of vices, and that is bigotry. The cruelty of that hatred of one's fellows, which we label bigotry, is so intense and so devastating that one, in quest of its cause, must pass beyond the ordinary depravity of the world and the flesh and look for that cause in the devil." End quote. To Mr. Ween, I am also indebted for this defense of loquaciousness by Blue. Blue was talkative. It is only natural that he should defend himself. Besides, he had an, an antipathy to silent men. They were silent, he maintained, because they had nothing to say. Silence to him was a mask of vacuity. He was constantly amused at the success of the ruse. All the greatest men of the world, he maintained, were talkers. Quote, it is the humble man who risks his dignity to speak up for what he loves. It is the courageous man who dares contradiction and the acrimony of argument to defend his beliefs. If one loves anything, truth, beauty, woman, life, one will speak out. Genuine love cannot endure silence. Genuine love breaks out into speech. And when it is great love, it breaks out into song. Talk helps to relieve us of the tiresome burden of ourselves. It helps some of us to find out what we think. It is essential for the happiest companionship. One of the minor pleasures of affection is in the voicing of it. If you love your friend, says the song, tell him so. Talk helps one to get rid of the surplus enthusiasm that often blurs our ideas. Talk, as the sage says, relieves the tension of grief by dividing it. Talk is one of man's privileges, and with a little care it may be one of his blessings. The successful conversationalist is not the epigram maker, for sustained brilliance is blinding. The successful conversationalist says unusual things in a usual way. The successful conversationalist is not the man who does not think stupid things, but the man who does not say the stupid things he thinks. Silence is essential to every happy conversation, but not too much silence. Too much silence may mean boredom or bewilderment, bewilderment, and it may mean scorn, for silence is an able weapon of pride." End quote. There are two letters which are both rather heavy and rather long. Blue must have been in a pedantic mood, a rare mood for him, when he wrote them. One is sent in by Mr. Albert Considine of New York City. Mr. Considine first met Blue, he says, at a hockey match. Ice hockey was a game, Mr. Considine tells him, that had a tremendous attraction for Blue. The letter has, however, nothing to do with hockey. It has, among other things, a commentary on the neglect of laughter in history, and is shrewd for a man who read as little as Blue. Quote, People remember sorrow much longer than they remember laughter. It is easier to revive your sad hours than it is to revive your gay ones. It is too bad, with all the amiability in the world, that tears should be so facile and laughter require so much effort. Literature is to be blamed. It has never cooperated with the gayer side of mankind. The biographer is to be blamed as well as the poet and the novelist. The biographer devotes his pages usually to the serious thoughts and undertakings of his subject. His laughter, however much or little it may be, is rarely recreated. The biographer exaggerates the serious side of man to give him importance. For it has always been felt, peculiarly enough, that seriousness is a sign of importance. The biographer stresses a man's work so much that the reader is led to believe that the subject did little else. And yet all men loaf far more than they work, all great men especially. 
It is a misfortune that the seriousness of men lives after them while their gaiety dies with them. There is a great need of a new school of biographers, and there is similarly great need for a new school of historians. The history of the past, especially the distant past, reads much like a long and somber obituary. And yet, those men of other days were as gay and gayer than we. As with individuals, so with peoples. Their gaiety dies with them, but their seriousness goes on forever. Historians describe early peoples as especially severe, gray creatures moving stolidly through laughterless twilights. Yet their presumption is that early peoples, especially the so-called primitive peoples, were immensely much happier and hardier than we. Primitive peoples, as we find them in contemporary life, are most always gay. The older a civilization, the more it approaches the glumness of stagnation. Capacity for laughter could well be employed as the index of the wisdom of a man or a civilization. End quote. The other letter was written to Dr. Frederick W. O'Brien of Boston, Massachusetts, on Blues returning to him a copy of Thoreau's Walden. It has to do with Thoreau, of whom Blue seems to have known quite a little. It commends Thoreau's meditation on the pages headed, What I Lived For, and then goes on. Quote, now and then a writer with an imagination on fire gives, truth, gives to truth a brilliant and spectacular beauty that is at once arresting and audacious. Such men are rare, and it is well to notice that it is their imaginations which are on fire, not their minds. For truth lends itself no more to theatricalism than the mountains, despite the psalm, lend themselves to dancing. dancing. Particularly grotesque Chinese lanterns seen across the lawn of a summer's night may appear arresting and audacious, but they are only Chinese lanterns. They decorate and beguile. They distract attention from the modest stars. But the stars are steadfast. They are mighty masses stabbing darkness with tiny dagger points. To the searcher for sensationalism, they may be too monotonous, but they move the thoughtful man to profound speculation and they make him humble. Modern ideas, with all the flash and sudden attractiveness of novelty, are Chinese lanterns. Truths are like the stars. End quote. We are indebted to Mrs. John Murphy of Ruggles Street, Roxbury, Massachusetts, for this last letter. Mrs. Murphy runs a lodging house for men from the yard. These are, I understand, men who work for the railroad nearby. Recently, when Mrs. Murphy was doing the lodger's room, she came across a biographical note I had written on Blue. Quote, I knew him in a jiffy, she says. He was with me for a few months after the war. A brave, smiling lad. I thought he had the consumption. He was the kind, but his health was of the best. End quote. Such was her picture of him. Blue puzzled Mrs. Murphy. She judged him one of those boys who always mean well, but who, as she put it, never pay the rent. Mrs. Murphy is a trifle hard. Anyone might be after 30 years in a lodging house. She's a big, round woman whose shrewd eyes belie the hardiness of herself. I spoke to him one day, she says, how the rent was due. Oh, but he had a smiling way with him. It would melt the heart of a wheelbarrow. I forgot, Mrs. Murphy, he says. I forgot. Honest. I asked my mother this morning for it. Sure enough, he had the rent the next day. He wanted to pay me double. Let's be good friends, he says. It's black, bad business, this money. Do you see how it comes between us? Where Blue obtained the rent, Mrs. Murphy never did discover. His mother had been dead twelve years or more, he told me once, explained Mrs. Murphy. Perhaps his asking his mother was a joke of his. He was always a joking. Once Big Jim Deneen, a fine, strong, good-living man, hit O'Brien, and O'Brien drunk. Blue picked up O'Brien, picked him up the good for nothing like you would a child. Poor Deneen, he says to O'Brien. Poor Deneen, but I feel sorry for him. And the rest of us feeling sorry for O'Brien. A strange lad he was, indeed, a strange lad. Blue left Mrs. Murphy's establishment abruptly. 
That is, he went out one day and no one heard from him thereafter. His rent was paid up and beyond, says Mrs. Murphy, and the things he left were of no use at all. I couldn't give them even to the Salvation Army, much less to the sisters. A shirt, a hairbrush, and a pack of pair of socks. He never had much, poor fellow, but he always looked well. Wholesome, I mean, and company-like. I think it was how we used to look at his face and not at the rest of him. But one thing he left which Mrs. Murphy kept, bless her. That was a long letter, typewritten and addressed to my good dear mother. I can picture Blue walking into a public stenographer with his manuscript and asking her to typewrite it. And I can picture the stenographer as she made the copy. Mrs. Murphy, had she a little more imagination, could have discovered in the letter who it was who paid Blue's rent. I must confess I liked the letter. I find a quality in it that wins me. Blue, properly directed, could have made some money out of his talent. I think he could have run a successful column on a daily newspaper. He had the human touch, which could have been very fruitfully capitalized. The letter goes, quote, My good dear mother, I have never liked any painting or statue of you I have ever seen. It is not that these representations disappoint me. That would be natural when I expect so much. It is that they touch me in no way at all as you have touched me yourself. I have no clear conception of you, yet you are more real to me than the people around me. Oh, much more real than they. A thousand times, a thousand more real than they. Sometimes, it is true, my imagination supplies me with brief fancies of you, but they have no permanence. I do not keep them for my prayers. Yet even these brief fancies are unlike any representation of you I have ever seen. Sometimes I have a quick picture of you as a mother with your face lined and worn with sorrow and your hair gray. You are a little woman, bowed, but your eyes are full and clear with understanding. I suppose the theologians would object to such a representation of you. Many little mothers like this have I seen, and I cannot tell you how my heart has been hurt for them. They, too, have come back from their cavalry, poor creatures, neglected and mute, paying the price of great love. I know that you, mother, regardless of the theologians, will understand this picture of mine of you. You know these mothers who love you so. You are the mother of them all. Then I have another glimpse of you. You are a young mother, robust, active, with smiling eyes. I think Hilary Pepler has this picture in his verses. Our lady was a milkmaid, a peasant girl, and poor. She whom Almighty God obeyed would scrub the dairy floor. Our lady well could merry make and sing sweet songs to him of butter, cheese, and curdle cake, of how to milk and skim. I am sure you like Pepler's various verses about you. I wish I could write as well as he can. There would then be no need of this letter. But this quick, quick picture of you as a young mother, which I have now and then, is extremely vivid. The main quality of it is your activity. You do not sit drearily. You do not move sanctimoniously about. There is a certain health and almost exuberance to your actions. I expect you to come right up and speak to me. You know John Mickle, who has the candy shop on the corner? John claims he saw you one night. The people say that John is queer. Maybe. I know he used to limp a little before he met you, and he doesn't limp now. I know, too, that you've come to many people, and it's always struck me as especially appropriate that your most important visits were to humble, common people. You might very well have come to John. John, you know, doesn't talk much about it. The story is in his eyes, though. Once he told me how it was. He had been over to see his sister, who was ill. On the way home, you came up to him. Hello, John, you said. He felt absolutely natural with you. I can imagine that is the way you would come to people. You would call them by their first names. John is a good man. I think he's a saint. But you know more about that than I do. And if you really did visit John, you have a very good reason for it. All of this is apart from the purpose of this letter. I simply am telling you that I have no definite picture of you as I write to you. But, Mother, you are so real 
that if you withdrew your support, I think I would actually fall down on the floor here like a man in a faint. Dear mother, how have you endured me all these years? Only for you, I would have long been lost. For you it is who took me and led me out of strange ways and darknesses years ago. You it is who takes me by the hand now day by day. Only you would not grow tired of the like of me, of anyone so sinful, ungrateful, selfish. I'm afraid, mother, of your son. I should be afraid of him. I would not dare to lift my head were it not for you. For it is you who stand between me and his terrible justice. You see, I cannot make myself clear to you, but I know you know I am not trying to be humble. The thought of my sin smites me down, so that if there were not you, I think I would fall into despair. And when I try to reason why you should continue to protect me, I end in confusion. I can only throw myself on your love. I can only kneel and cry out, I don't deserve anything, not even the greeting of a stranger. But mother, without you, what am I, what am I going to do? This is mad, isn't it? This is unreasonable. But I am helpless in my weakness. I, cowardly, feebly, selfishly, give the weight of my sins to you. The other day, mother, I was thinking of what people would say when I'm dead. So I thought I would leave them a line for my grave. That is, if I have a grave. I don't care one way or another. But I do wish someone would write these lines about me somewhere. Never was there a worse sinner, and never was God kinder to one. Mother, it's true. You know how true it is. You are the only explanation of God's kindness to me. End quote. So Blue's letter ends. It is typical of Blue. Begins by accident and ends up in the air. But I think it makes good reading. You see what I mean about Blue having the human touch that could be capitalized? They say humor sells best nowadays. But I really think that Blue's sincerity, under astute management, could have been made to pay dividends. You meet plenty of witty men, but, there, but very few sincere ones. I am sure I have an idea here. Mrs. Murphy does not agree with me. She knows men, she says, and if ever there was a useless one, it was blue. She is still wondering how on earth he ever paid the rent. Here, then, before me are these eleven letters, a motley queer eleven, the letters of an unusual lad. I knew Blue's faults as well as any man, his improvidence, his erraticism, his impracticability, I mourn that he did not put his mind to business. He might have left us a great legacy of commercial achievement, a noted name in the history of the practical progress of the world. Instead, he has left us only these ragged letters, such as they are, and the memory of his strange self. <laughs>